Love him or hate him, you've heard the name. He's been called by some a voice of reason in the wilderness of a society gone mad and by others an alt-right attention funnel leading contemporary youth down the path to fascism. The fact is, he's neither of those things. Peterson, I'm going to describe, is best considered an artifact of popular culture, YouTube and social media to be specific, a man at the right place at the right time with a message that seemed to work for its intended purpose, that being for Peterson himself to bask in the spotlight of the public intellectual. But he took a shortcut paid a price for it. Jordan B. Peterson was born in Alberta, Canada in 1962. His career until 2016 was that of, by any reasonable measure, a respectable academic psychologist. Peterson Peterson spent a few years on the faculty of the psychology department at Harvard, published an impressive number of peer-reviewed academic papers in top journals, mentored graduate students, and by 2016, was a full professor at University of Toronto. However, it's worth noting that beyond some local TV appearances, it wasn't Peterson's academic work that brought him to public attention and made him a cultural flashpoint. Rather, it was Peterson's opposition to Canadian Bill C-16 and this viral video in which Peterson is confronted by a group of trans activists in late 2016. Whether you agree or disagree with his positions on the issue, this event put an international spotlight on Peterson as principled speaker for the opposition to a growing force in popular culture. In other words, right or wrong, there was a market demand for people able to espouse an intellectual opposition to the increasing visibility and demands of those with non-conforming gender experiences and the receptivity to those demands by official institutions. Now, in my opinion, Peterson had little to offer here. It's a little bit of an intellectual leap to scaffold all the way from his academic work on meaning and belief systems to his various pronouncements about postmodern Marxists at the root of university PC culture and the subsequent fall of Western society. Nonetheless, Peterson was more than ready to act out the role of public intellectual, even when he had to pull ideas out of his ass to keep the charade on track at all times. And I don't say that to disparage his pre-fame book, Maps of Meaning, or his young-influenced work on belief systems, or any of his work in academic psychology. It's just to say that Peterson's academic expertise was not the most robust foundation on which to construct the reactionary, yet broad and universal, historical and philosophical anti-Marx slash postmodernism slash PC culture narrative on which his YouTube fame was based. Peterson started his YouTube channel and began uploading videos in 2013. However, it wasn't until the viral trans activist video toward the end of 2016 that his YouTube channel began its meteoric meteoric rise. I can't find a resource for Peterson's YouTube analytics prior to 2017, but this one nonetheless demonstrates the rise of his YouTube channel viewership since that time. It's not difficult to see that it was the end of 2016 when his YouTube viewership began its fast rise from the relatively obscure to having his thumbnail seen all over the platform. Also, if we take a look at Peterson's Google Scholar profile, we see a more than respectable number of citations. Number of citations simply is an indication, or it simply means the frequency with uh, which a given researcher is referenced in papers by other researchers. It's a common measure of influence in an academic field. Now, while definitely more impressive than your average academic psychologist, Peter is nonetheless dwarfed by by the citation statistics of other psychologists with more significant influence in the field, including public intellectuals such as Steven Pinker, Daniel Kahneman, and Jonathan Haidt and by less publicly known yet academically influential psychologists such as John Anderson, Lisa Barrett, or Leda Cosmides. Again, the point of this 
isn't to disparage Peterson's academic record, but to highlight the fact that the Jordan Peterson we know today is a product of popular culture and YouTube, not academic contributions. To provide his newfound audience of mostly young YouTube viewers the content it demanded, Peterson concocted a tall tale of university PC culture as the tip of the march through the academy spear of the postmodern Marxists intent on resurrecting the ghost of Joseph Stalin and destroying the very foundations of Western civilization. Now, it sounded plausible to an audience in search of its very own official smart guy to provide a model of a complex world that's both simple and soothing to existing belief structures. But as it turns out, this wasn't the only trick Peterson had up his sleeve. He capitalized on his fame by releasing a best-selling self-help self-help book, 12 Rules for Life, in 2018. Now, personally, I see his book as an innocuous advice book for young people. It has little to do with Karl Marx, postmodernism, or PC woke culture. I personally don't see much to complain about regarding a self-help book, and I'll leave it up to its primary audience of consumers to judge. I get the impression that Peterson sought to be a genuinely thought-provoking educator. And frankly, I appreciate that. For example, in his YouTube videos, Peterson encourages his young fans to read an impressive list of classic literary works, both fiction and nonfiction. If he's truly successful in convincing young people to read these titles, I think he's done them a favor. Also, Peterson has often brought real and legitimate intellectual acumen to bear in some extremely delightful ways. To me, his BBC interview with Kathy Newman is an absolute classic takedown of an arrogant, moralizing white liberal media elite. After listening to Peterson for a while, I get the sense that he pines for a sort of patriarchal 1950s-era North American mythology or archetype where life centers around a nuclear family and religion and the dad goes to work and the mom stays home, sexuality is predictable, and so on and so forth. And I'm sure this is a major part of his appeal. There are also times he seems prone to grossly overcomplicate and generate controversy over what's really a simple observation. His lobster claims, for example. Famously, Peterson several times used the lobster as literal evidence of a physiological predisposition to social hierarchy in humans. Peterson notes the presence and impact of certain neurotransmitter substances on the social behavior of lobster, and makes the inference that an analogous chemical emotional process is present in humans, which then predisposes humans to social hierarchy as well. Now, it's not that such a biological relation is completely beyond the realm of possibilities. It's just that the scientific research Peterson mentions is at best too incomplete, or even too contrary, to reasonably make an inference about humans and social hierarchies based on the presence of certain chemicals in both humans and lobsters. Now, had Peterson simply made the argument, for example, that we can see social hierarchy throughout the animal kingdom, including closely related primate species, and just dropped his lobster thing completely, he could have made his point much more simply and effectively. After all, there is real evidence for the idea of a biological influence on social structure and the potential impact of this on our thinking around social issues ought to be considered. However, Peterson's attempt to infer directly from lobster physiology to human social behavior is too easily perceived as a word salad of suspect intent. However, Peterson's true vulnerability was to be found in the very thing that made him famous. The thing that made him famous in the first place was his willingness to hold forth on the Marx slash postmodernism slash PC culture thing. Anyone with a marginally well-read background in Marx and or postmodernism will immediately see the gaping void in this particular component of the Peterson intellectual backstory. Peterson seemed to be making the claim that degenerate hippies from the 1960s had followed Herbert Marcuse's promotion of the long march through the institution as a method for establishing the conditions for communist revolution 
and that university PC culture was part of this strategy. Communist revolution, according to Peterson, is for all practical purposes the resurrection of a woke Joseph Stalin, and it'll be the gulag for anyone who complains. So damn, that seems scary. It captured people's attention. But on closer examination, one is hard-pressed to find any sort of academic paper trail or intellectual progression of an ideology or core vision of the world from Marx through Stalin to contemporary university safe spaces, pronoun guidelines, syllabus trigger warnings, etc. Camille Paglia, I think, had it right during her interview with Peterson that 60s radicals by and large avoided the universities, and P PC culture in itself does not flow from a particular political ideology. Now, I would argue that PC culture is about bureaucratic power and social management by teams of self-appointed elite experts. I can find little real ideology to it at all. It could operate under Stalinism, fascism, American capitalism, feudalism, or a posadist UFO communist utopia. It's all about bureaucratic control. Now, things, to have, things seem to have come to a head for Peterson in late 2018, following his horrendous performance at his happiness, capitalism versus Marxism debate with Slavoj Zizak. It's worth noting that professionally, Peterson had, within two years of this event, essentially abandoned his academic career for YouTube fame. And his YouTube fame hadn't come from an academic level of expertise in the subject matter for which he was most well known, Marx and postmodernism in the academy as the root of all evil in contemporary society. Yet now he was set to go head to head with the world's most famous academic Marxist in a massively hyped live event. Peterson had successfully avoided confrontational debates where his knowledge of Marx could be directly tested. For example, he canceled a scheduled interview with Sublation Media Zone Douglas Lane. It was easy enough for Peterson to match wits with pumpkin headed TV personalities and to find platforms where his condemnation of leftists would draw mindless applause. And for a couple of years, this is how he built his brand. So it was a bit surprising to see Peterson and Slavoj Zizak scheduled in a head to head Marxism versus capitalism debate in front of a live worldwide audience. You can watch the video for yourself, but in a nutshell, it featured Slavoj Zizek delivering a nuanced treatise on happiness informed by his encyclopedic knowledge of Marx and the intellectual history surrounding it. Peterson, by comparison, attacked the 19th century revolutionary communism of the Communist Manifesto as if the entire intellectual history of Marx was going to somehow be negated by that. It was akin to watching one of those creationism versus evolution debates where an enthusiastic but horrendously underinformed fundamentalist Christian preacher thinks he's proven creationism correct and negated modern biology by demanding to know why monkeys still exist. There were times during this performance when Peterson truly looked troubled. Moments like this one must have been crushing for Peterson. Historical question yeah, for politely saying you are an idiot, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> It's simply, I would like to know, because you, and I like this often, when you attack somebody, you said aggressively, and what should, read more, tell me whom. So I'm asking you now, not read more, I don't advise you, but who are, give me some names and so on, and who are these postmodern egalitarian neo-Marxists, and where do you see any kind even of, of Marxism? I see in it mostly... Um, an impotent, an utterly impotent moralization. Please, I'm well, so sorry that that was No, no, that's, that's no long. problem. Please. Well, I mean, um, organ While his audience may have not have noticed, Peterson certainly knew that among those back at the university, the peer group he had long sought to impress, the jig was up. It was undeniably clear at this point that Peterson had abandoned any trace of intellectual honesty in a thoroughly public way. In the end, Peterson and Zizak agreed with each other that university PC culture is a negative force in society. In other words, Peterson agreed with the world's most famous academic Marxist that PC culture in the academy isn't Marxist. 
Suffice it to say that many viewers left the debate with the belief that Peterson had been utterly defeated with regard to his claims of a Marxism, postmodernism, PC culture, end of Western civilization juggernaut. Peterson's public visibility began to diminish soon after the Zizek debate. By the end of 2020, the Peterson camp began providing an explanation for this. It turns out Peterson had developed an addiction to benzodiazepines over the past year, had flown to Russia, where he was placed in a medically induced coma, and then in a month of intensive care. In 2021, Peterson was back on YouTube, once again posting videos to a large audience. In this second act, however, he seems to be trying to downplay or minimize his role as expert on the alleged Marx postmodernism woke culture axis. His current videos are primarily interviews with mainstream academics and writers hawking books to Peterson's large audience. So what are we to make of Jordan Peterson? In summary, I see him as someone who sought the trappings of the public intellectual and capitalized on the attention that befell him in 2016 to try and make it happen. At worst, he leveraged the anti-intellectual propensities of popular culture for YouTube fame. At best, maybe he encouraged young people to read a few books and clean their rooms, and more recently has provided an outlet for a few authors to get their books in front of the public. I do want to add one final item to this discussion. Recently, Peterson posted this tweet, in which he provides a list of postmodern Marxists. Now, to those familiar with the works of the people on this list and Karl Marx, there will be great pushback as to how much Marx can be found in the work of any of these people. It's equivalent, I suppose, to a naive new atheist Richard Dawkins type who points at Westboro Baptist Church and says, see what Christianity leads to. From the most shallow of perspectives, sure, we can blame, blame Christianity for Westboro Baptist. But this certainly would fly in the face of Peterson's be precise in your speech admonition from his 12 Rules for Life and would expose the words of the speaker to suspicion of anti-Christian zealotry and purposeful misrepresentation. My challenge to the viewer is to simply go read Das Kapital. In fact, just add it to the list of books Peterson has already given you, and you'd have a truly brilliant list of titles. You can easily find free text and audio versions online. Then, listen to one of Peterson's tirades. Whatever he's on about, it isn't Marx. With regard to the postmodern Marxists on Peterson's list, I'm a very harsh critic of many of those people as well, as are other associates of sublation media. Most all the people he mentions do seem to follow along what could perhaps be called the progressive intersectionality and white fragility movement, the traits Peterson's postmodern Marxists seem to share are things like race essentialism and a tendency to de-emphasize the role of class and economics in favor of race and gender in social inequality. Neither of those things come from Marx. And they only have a cherry-picked sort of genesis in the postmodernism of, say, Michel Foucault. Even a term such as critical race theorists might be more descriptive of many of these people than postmodern Marxists. Maybe Peterson has simply resorted to name-calling here. Maybe postmodern Marxist is simply the label he chooses for writers and speakers I would call progressive intersectionality and white fragility proponents, and he doesn't intend for the label to imply any specific intellectual history. Personally, for what it's worth, I have no requirement whatsoever that Peterson agree with or like the work of Karl Marx or any of the postmodernists thousands of pages of legit and legitimate and honest criticism have been written on all those topics. But if he's going to play the role of public intellectual, at a minimum, I do require him to be intellectually honest about the subjects on which he speaks. In the end, Peterson is a pop culture phenomenon whose story is still playing out. As is the case with most of these sorts of things, he's not been much of a philosopher and his cultural criticisms are a bit ill-informed. However, maybe he'll surprise us in the future. He continues to draw a large audience on YouTube and social media, and his self-help books are very popular. 
I'm hoping he chooses to pursue the intellectually honest path. I am the Reverend Dr. John Milton Bunch. If you enjoy these videos, you should click on the subscribe button and click that bell. You should also consider supporting me on Patreon. Patrons get access to a second behind the scenes parrot room discussion where we dish out gossip or go into the weeds on topics such as the tendency of the rate of profit to decline, imperialism, and the critical theories of Tiffany Percet and Donald Most. You'll also get access to both the public and private version of the revised Pop the Left series with Ashley Frawley and Pascal Robert, and the new Zoomer Philosophy series. Your support will not only make content like this possible, it will also help to establish a new publishing venture through Diet Soap Media. Right now, supporting me on Patreon will make a big difference.